Welcome to mini lesson 15. In this lesson, we're going to talk about the statistical mechanics of the photon gas, which is eventually how we're going to explain the shape of the black body radiation spectrum that we reviewed in the last mini lesson. We're still in chapter seven, we're doing section 7.4 of Schroeder. So I'm just going to remind you of the situation we were in uh, ex in terms of the tension between experiment and predictions last time. So experimentally, if you measure the spectrum of a black body, the radiation has this peak shape like the red or the blue curve. But if you do classical statistical mechanics calculations, you get this catastrophe where the predicted light intensity blows up at high energies and is way above the peak and never comes back down again. And so Planck figured out that you could quantize the energy of the electromagnetic radiation uh, to fix this problem and make this green curve bend down into a peak shape like the red or the blue curves. Um, and he was actually pretty conservative. And I don't think at the beginning he really felt that this was a, a fundamental discovery. Um, in fact, I think he, he mostly thought this was something funny about the properties of the matter in the solid black body uh, that was that was causing this radiation to appear to be quantized uh, but in the end we realized that was kind of a fundamental fact about nature that in fact there are particles called photons that are the quanta of the electromagnetic field <clears throat> and so our idea uh, for today and is ultimately the correct idea is that a black body is a piece of matter that is sort of in thermal equilibrium with an ideal photon gas, right? And what we're gonna do is now calculate the statistical mechanics of that ideal photon gas. But before we do that, we need to point out that there are some very significant differences between the photon gas uh, and an ordinary gas, say an ideal gas, like we've talked about a lot in the past. And so number one, photons are massless. And so you get a relativistic energy momentum relationship where the energy of the photon has to be its momentum times the speed of light. Now this is just the relativistic E squared equals P squared C squared plus M squared C to the fourth where M goes to zero. So this is very different than the energy of, a, of, a, of an atom in the ideal gas which would be have an energy of P squared over 2M. Okay, so the second thing is photons are bosons, so they have spin equals one, that's an integer. Um, so that's important because we've already established that uh, bosons will need to obey Bose-Einstein occupation statistics, right? So we've, we're gonna be thinking about this photon gas in equilibrium with some matter at temperature T, and so we're gonna need to be thinking about the Bose-Einstein uh, occupation function. So number one and two, these facts are different, but they're, I think they're pretty easy for people to, to recognize that they must be true. Point number three is sort of subtle and unexpected, and that is photons are not conserved. Right? You can have any number of photons in the universe as long as you obey all the other conservation laws. Right? <clears throat> and so what this ends up implying is that the chemical potential of the photon gas is strictly zero. Right, so by contrast, right, the chemical potential of an ideal gas uh, is typically some negative number uh, and has units of energy, whatever. Photon gas always has chemical potential equal to zero. It's pretty hard to understand this. There's some discussion in Schroeder that I find iffy. Um, probably the best way to think about this is as an experimental fact. In the end, we're going to see that we can predict the black body radiation spectrum and that, in fact, this is true, right? And so um, <clears throat> experimental facts are the most valuable thing in physics. So that's, you know, from some perspective, good enough. There are a couple of other theoretical ways to look at it. I'll give you one that's not in Schroeder in the next slide. <clears throat> 
So one way to think about chemical potential that we haven't talked about in this class so far is that it's a Lagrange multiplier associated to maximizing entropy subject to a constraint of constant particle number. So the basic idea is we're given a function S equals KB ln omega, and we're given a constraint that capital N has to be equal to the sum on all the different levels labeled by I uh, of the number of particles in the level. And so basically the Lagrange multiplier associated to this constraint is the chemical potential. And so if you have this constraint, you will have the Lagrange multiplier. Since there is no constraint on photon number, photons are not conserved, chemical potential has to be zero. <clears throat> A similar uh, perspective can be taken on temperature. So temperature can be shown to be the Lagrange multiplier associated with the constraint of constant total energy. That constraint is obeyed by uh, the photon gas. You can't break energy conservation. <clears throat> and so in fact, the Lagrange multiplier exists and it's the temperature. Okay, but let's just go ahead and do, and do um, a little bit of the statistical mechanics of the photon gas. So as we said, we already know the Bose-Einstein distribution function. If you have uh, bosons <clears throat> in equilibrium with a reservoir at temperature T and some chemical potential, in this case it's going to be zero, you will obey this occupation number. number. It doesn't matter if you're photons, if you're pions, whatever. Right? Bosons will follow this occupation function. And so we plug in E equals HF, where F is a frequency and mu equals zero, and we get what's called the Planck occupation function. So we'll be using this over and over again. And this is basically just telling us, look, if you've got uh, a photon energy HF, the average number of photons with that energy follows this function, okay? <clears throat> What's kind of interesting about this is, in some ways, this partition function can be thought of as just the canonical partition function with energies equal to n times e, little, little epsilon, sorry, where little epsilon is just hf. And you use the geometric series to show that, that you'll get this expression. And in fact, this is roughly what Planck actually did. Like he was actually sort of messing around with these formula, trying to get something that defeated the ultraviolet catastrophe, and this is kind of how he did it. <clears throat> um, so yeah, you can check that that works. I think it's better to use the grand canonical starting point because it's actually true. Uh, in, in, some ways, in some ways, I think um, the fact that you could get away with using the canonical partition function here is just an artifact of, of the, the experimental fact that mu equals zero. Okay, so here's where we're going. We're gonna to try to calculate the total energy associated with the photon gas. And we need to think back to the degenerate Fermi gas where we did the same calculation. And you don't just need to think about the thermal occupation. In other words, you don't just need the Planck occupation to figure out <clears throat> the statistical properties of this gas. You need to also think about how many energy levels are there per unit energy. In other words, the density of states. <coughs> and so, I say this is a guess, but it's not really a guess. Um, we've sort of already developed a general approach to calculating uh, average quantities with quantum statistical occupation functions and densities of states. And so basically what you need to do is to calculate the total energy, you need to, oops, <clears throat> you need to take the energy and sum it up on the condition that there's a state there, so the density of states tells you that, and that the state is occupied uh, in thermal equilibrium, and the Planck occupation function tells you that, right? So this integral is just a fancy way of saying do the sum, but only if there's a state there and only if the state is occupied in thermal equilibrium, <clears throat> right? And so when I say things like, is there a state at energy E, what I really mean is, is there a state in a range of energies DE around E? Uh, 
that's just a mathematical technicality. So roughly speaking, we're going to follow Schroeder's derivation of this integral result. But I think we wouldn't have to if we knew all these parameters anyway. So I think this is actually something that we should start to feel comfortable with in PY413. You maybe don't, you maybe don't finally feel super comfortable with it, but it, it should sort of start to be something that makes sense to you why we're doing this. We'll come back to it uh, a few more times. So again, I'm, I'm roughly doing Schroeder's derivation, so you can read through his stuff as well. We're going to consider a box of photons of side length L in equilibrium at temperature T. And basic idea is if you would drill a small hole in the box and collect the photons that came out, um, you'd be able to measure the black body spectrum. Well, the basic idea is that because you're sort of confining the gas inside this box, you have a quantization condition on the wavelengths to be able to fit a half wavelength inside the box. <coughs> And then the de Broglie wavelength uh, of those photons gives you their momentum, which you can then plug into the relativistic energy momentum relation to get this expression for the energy of, let's call it the photon modes, right? <clears throat> so this is actually, again, a really significant difference compared to the Fermi gas, which was just massive particles with kinetic energy P squared over 2m. In that case, we had a quantum number that appeared as n squared. In this case here, we only have n. Uh, so this is just a sketch in one dimension. And so in three dimension, you basically repeat this sketch three times for each orthogonal direction. So the magnitude of the momentum is the sum of square is square rooted. And so you can write the total energy still in terms of this value n, but now n is square root of nx squared plus ny squared plus nz squared. And so our basic idea is we need to sum up all these energies, right? So we need to sum up the energy values multiplied by the occupation at that particular value, right? <clears throat> and so this, this line is just me sort of saying in words what we're planning to do. So the energy value is the E sub n that we got from the box energies. And the occupation is just the Planck occupation function evaluated at that particular energy. And then in this case, we need to realize that for each of these um, energy values, we have two independent polarizations. So it's like spin, but it's not spin. Um, that's sort of spin, whatever. Let's just call it polarization. So we only have two polarizations of the electromagnetic waves because they have to be transverse waves, they can't be longitudinal. All right, so let's just try to evaluate this sum. So we plug in values, we got two for polarization. We're now summing on nx, ny, and nz. These are the energy values. And then this is the Planck occupation function where I just wrote the, the n as this. <clears throat> and so we'll convert the sum to an integral. So you've basically got n, which is that big square root, integrating over all the possible n values um, with the Planck thing in the denominator. And so we're going to do our usual trick of thinking, OK, nx and y and z are an abstract space, and we can sort of do geometry. And so in this case, we're just going to convert nx and y and z Cartesian axes to polar axes. Right, so there you can define sort of a radius and some angles in this abstract space. So we convert to polar, um, and the, the volume element becomes n squared sine theta dn d theta d phi. <coughs> um, so that's fine. This is the polar version of this Cartesian integral. And now we can actually do the angular integrals. You get pi halves, uh, and you're left with all of this junk, where we're just saying energy is hcn over 2l. C is the speed of light, by the way. And we'll solve uh, for n in terms of energy and just plug in in terms of energy. <clears throat> so if you look here, uh, you've got an energy cubed in the numerator. Um, let's, let's break off one of the energies and write the, rewrite this integral as e times this expression times this expression integrated over all energy. 
And this is exactly the integral that I said we could probably guess we were going to get at the end. So in some ways, what I've just done in the last few slides is prove to you that the sum over all the energies does indeed convert to an integral that looks like this, right? So E is this value here that we were going to sum up. This expression is what's telling us, do we have a state available at that energy E? And then this is the Planck occupation function that's just telling us, okay, at that energy E, would you actually be occupied in equilibrium at temperature T? All right, and so in some ways, the quantum mechanics is here, the statistical mechanics is here in the Planck function. And, but what this also immediately allows us to do is that, to say that the density of states of the photon gas is this middle uh, expression here, and so it grows as E squared. Again, very different than the density of states of an ordinary gas, which grows as a square root of energy. So what we just did in this slide is basically Schroeder's problem 7.40, which sometimes I assign as a homework problem, but not this semester. <clears throat> All right, so let's rearrange it slightly and just write it like this. And the thing I wanna note is that if you look at the integrand and you would just plot the integrand, the thing inside the integral, as a function of energy, you will get exactly the black body spectrum. And so this um, function that appears in the integrand is the black body spectrum. It's telling you basically how many photons per unit energy are available to you. And to get the total energy, you need to actually sum all those up. So sort of do the integral of this curve, which does not look like this. <clears throat> it's more like a step than a peak, right? So the interesting point is, so, so that's the number one thing. I think I wanna say, we've actually explained the black body spectrum now because this expression inside the integrand is exactly what we need to be, to basically tell us the light intensity at different energies, right? Along the, um, uh, associated with the gas. So if we want to keep going with it, what we can note is that this integral, this is a definite integral, and it's just some number, right? So to see that, we'll substitute x equals e over kBT. And so that expression now becomes internal energy divided by the volume of the box is some constants times kBT to the fourth power, where you know, in changing variables, we've had to factor out a KBT. That's probably something you should be able to do. It's not hard at all, but make sure that's easy for you to understand. Um, and now you can sort of see that this is whatever, some number, and you can even look up the value of this integral. It's a known, it's a known integral, and it has a value of pi to the fourth over 15, which is about six and a half. And so we can plug all that in, and we can get that the energy, the internal energy divided by the box volume is proportional to temperature to the fourth power. So this is also something that we knew experimentally about black bodies, and that is that um, you have this relationship uh, between sort of the, the power radiated by the black body at temperature T uh, and the fourth power of temperature. So that's called the Stefan Boltzmann law. <coughs> It's probably, probably Stefan Boltzmann is a little bit different than U over V, but it basically comes from the same place. Um, so my basic assertion is that we have explained black body radiation by just noting that photons are bosons and we can calculate the sort of energy per unit energy interval uh, of a gas of photons at temperature T. Um, and so what we'll do next time is actually take these results and start to calculate thermodynamic properties of the photon gas other than the internal energy. So see you then.